Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Repurposing and COVID-19. Can we identify new antivirals? We are so glad you could join us for the coronavirus virtual event series, and we hope you're doing well and staying safe. I'm Xavier Gutierrez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. Now, before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. And if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located in the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Sarah Cherry, Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and Microbiology at Perelman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Cherry, you may now begin your presentation. Much. I'm really delighted to be here today to talk to you about our recent work trying to identify uh, new antivirals that might be active against the SARS coronavirus. So as you know, over the last few months, this pandemic has spread across the globe and uh, infected uh, a huge number of people. These are data from about a month ago, really demonstrating that the virus has really um, become a pandemic across the globe. And so in trying to think about how we can have an impact on this uh, horrible disease, we, there are sort of two major uh, approaches that are being taken by a variety of investigators across the globe. So one is the development of vaccines uh, in order to um, prevent the initial infection of individuals. And there are a large number of groups and, and companies pursuing this avenue. In addition, the other approach, which is the one that we're taking, is trying to identify drugs that might be active against SARS coronavirus in order to um, ameliorate disease uh, once people are infected. And so um, the SARS coronavirus is an RNA virus, and all viruses have to co-opt and subvert many pathways and processes within a host cell in order to replicate. So they're obligate intracellular parasites, and so they have to bind to host cells. They have to um, enter those host cells by crossing a membrane to get into the cytoplasm. And then once in the cytoplasm, the viruses have to make more of themselves. They use the host translation machinery to make more proteins, and they use their own machinery as well as um, cellular machinery in order to make additional copies of their RNA genomes, in addition to make mRNAs to be translated. So once this virus can replicate to high levels, it can uh, undergo um, assembly and exit in order to infect the next cells. So all viruses use their own encoded machinery. And so uh, those are potential drug targets, as well as all of the myriad of, of cellular proteins that are required to allow the virus to replicate within cells and uh, promote infection. So that leads to sort of the two main classes of antivirals, which we're trying to identify. So there are the ones that are called direct acting antivirals. So those are the ones that are targeting these viral proteins that are essential for replication. So a really good example of that is remdesivir. So remdesivir is a small molecule drug that can target the virally encoded RNA dependent RNA polymerase that's required for the virus to replicate. So if you can block the activity of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, then you can block replication of the virus. And so remdesivir has shown efficacy in clinical trials and is being uh, more widely used. So there are lots of other um, viral proteins that are required to allow the virus to replicate, and targeting those viral proteins would also potentially allow you to block viral replication. Another group of direct acting antivirals that there's a lot of uh, work being done around are the identification of neutralizing antibodies. So many individuals who are infected with the virus develop antibodies and those antibodies help the person to clear infection. 
but then it can, they also help to prevent reinfection. So if you could identify highly active neutralizing antibodies from, for example, an infected individual, you could either directly use that, those antibodies to block infection in a new in individual, and that's what the convalescent serum trials are based on, or you could create drugs from those antibodies directly, and those are called therapeutic antibodies, and one example are these nanobodies that are being developed. So that's not another group of um, antivirals that directly bind to the virus to block infection, for example. There are another group of uh, antivirals that uh, can be very active, and those are called the host-targeted antivirals. So these are, are um, drugs that can target human proteins. So as I said, the virus has to bind to cell surface receptors. It has to get triggered to uh, enter into the cytoplasm. It has to create more RNAs and more proteins, and it uses much of the host machinery in order to accomplish these tasks. So if you could target any of the human proteins that are required for this process, then you would be able to block the ability of the virus to establish infection. So there are many examples of the development of therapeutics against human proteins, for example, entry factors. So as I said, the, vir the virus has to bind to cell surface receptors, and SARS-2 uses uh, a protein called ACE2 as the receptor. So if you could somehow block ACE2 or block the interaction between the virus and ACE2, for example, then you could block the ability for the virus to enter cells. Additionally, the virus has to be triggered uh, in order to enter cells, and we'll talk more about that later. And so if you could block the triggering mechanism, again, you could block the ability of the virus to establish infection, and so you could then use those as therapeutics. Another example of host-targeted antivirals are a bit more indirect, or, or they can be direct uh, in infected cells, and those are called immunomodulators. So if you could modulate the immune system of an individual, for example, by inducing early immunity, you might be able to block the ability of the virus to establish infection. And one of the pathological consequences of infection with this virus has to do with an increased cytokine um, production, which can cause inflammation and other uh, coagulation defects. And so, again, if you could modulate this immune response, you might be able to ameliorate at least disease, if not viral replication. And so there's a variety of, of approaches towards the discovery of immunomodulators, which would, again, um, either block infection directly or ameliorate the pathogenesis associated with this infection. So we're interested in identifying um, both classes of antivirals in order to get our, have our best chance at being able to impact disease outcomes. So this brings us to the question of, well, how would we find these drugs and, and how would we do this? So uh, my lab is an academic lab, and um, we uh, have access to uh, available drugs. And so we began to think about whether or not we could repurpose approved drugs for use against this, this newly emerged virus. So there are many drugs that have been approved in humans. So there are about 3,500 current FDA-approved drugs. And um, this is a, a, the circular uh, pie chart is showing you what these, were, what these target. So they can target a diverse array of different uh, cellular targets. And they were de you know, developed for many different diseases, from cancer to uh, immune problems to neuronal, neur neur uh, neuronal problems. So one could consider them. We don't actually know which cellular uh, proteins are required for replication. So maybe inadvertently the virus uses some ion channel for which we have an inhibitor. And if we treated cells or, or individuals with that inhibitor, we could block infection. So the idea here is that there are many approved drugs. And the question is, are any of them active to block SARS-2 replication? So one would, of course, start by thinking about antivirals, uh, approved antivirals. And in fact, um, there are very few actually approved antivirals. Uh, the numbers that one can find as of 2016, there were actually only 70 FDA approved antivirals. But that is, a, that is also another place to look for um, antivirals that might also act against SARS-2. In fact, remdesivir, the drug that I mentioned earlier that's been approved against SARS-2 was actually first developed against a different RNA virus, and it was found to also have activity against this virus. 
So again, the idea of repurposing or reusing drugs that were developed for some other uh, reason really has um, uh, potentially great utility. So once we, once we thought about which drugs we might want to look at, we had to uh, come up with a strategy for identifying antivirals. And so I'm also the uh, scientific director of the High Throughput Screening Corps here at Penn, where we have robotics and we have um, drug libraries that we use uh, routinely to screen for antivirals with other viruses as well as other biologies. So we were able to rapidly um, obtain the SARS-2 coronavirus and develop a, a pipeline to screen for drugs that were antiviral. So what we do is we take a multi uh, well, multi-well plates. So we use 384 well plates and we can seed them with cells and then we can use robotics to add the drugs to the cells and then uh, infect them with uh, the SARS-CoV-2. And we do that in the BSL-3 under containment uh, so that way no one can inadvertently get infected with the virus. So then we let the virus replicate within cells, and then we uh, fix and stain the cells and use automated microscopy to image uh, each well to ask whether or not um, the drug that we put in that well impacts the ability of the virus to establish infection. So here is an example where we have um, some wells where uh, on the left, there's a well with no activity. So you can see lots of blue dots. Those are the, the total number of cells in the well. And you can see lots of green dots, and those are the infected cells. And if we identify an antiviral, what we're looking for are wells where the cells are still viable so that the drug is not cytotoxic, but that it can block the ability for the virus to establish infection. So they'll be blue, but not green cells. And so this is the strategy that we've uh, undertaken. And um, then the question is, well, again, where are we going to get these drug libraries? So what we've done is we've um, put together our own in-house libraries as well as collaborated with a number of different groups in order to bring in additional libraries. So we've uh, basically purchased all the antivirals that have been reported in the literature. We have our own in-house repurposing library within the High Throughput Screening Corps at Penn. We've uh, begun work or we've been working with Medicines for Malaria Venture. So they um, have a, their own uh, set of compounds that include uh, chloroquine, which was first developed for malaria and all the chloroquine derivatives. We've been working with the National Center for Advancing Translational Science, or NCATS, and they've uh, provided us for another 2,500 drugs uh, in their repurposing libraries. And we've also uh, collaborated with uh, Caliber and the Gates Foundation where we've obtained another 12,000 drugs, um, and that uh, screen is actually almost uh, complete. So we're really trying to capture as much uh, space as we can to identify drugs that are active again uh, against SARS-CoV-2 um, in our screening uh, assays. So the idea here is to go from our high throughput screens where we can screen thousands of compounds to then go into validation mode where we basically uh, do dose responses in a variety of cell types to determine um, the activity of the um, antiviral and how toxic it is to so look at cytotoxicity. And then to take our, our most potent and non-toxic kits and move them into resp primary respiratory cells. So as most of you probably know, the virus is a respiratory pathogen and can infect both the nasal epithelium as well as uh, the airways and bronchial epithelial cells. So we have a number of models in the lab where we can directly test drugs on these um, uh, primary mature cells. And then the idea is to take these into preclinical testing in, for example, hamster and mouse models to then ultimately bring these um, compounds to clinical trials. So this is really our, our, our pipeline that we're trying to uh, accomplish in order to ultimately get uh, new therapeutics into the clinic. Okay. So where are we? So we started, uh, like I said, a few months ago when uh, we were able to obtain the virus. I think that was in uh, late February, late February, early March. And so the first thing we had to do was develop this uh, microscopy-based assay to look to see if we can identify antivirals. And so Vero cells are an African green monkey cell line that are used by many, many investigators. And it's really the cell line of choice to grow many viruses in 
including SARS-CoV-2. So in fact, we initially amplified the virus in these cells, so we knew that these cells were highly permissive. And so the first thing we did was try to develop a, a robust microscopy-based assay to quantify the number of infected cells. So here I'm showing you, again, some microscopy images of either uninfected cells or SARS-CoV-2 infected cells that we could stain for two different viral antigens. So one is anti-double-stranded RNA, and that's shown in red, and the other is anti-spike, shown in green. And so double-stranded RNA is an intermediate in the RNA replication cycle of this virus. And so uh, infected cells have very bright double-stranded RNA staining. And spike is the receptor for the virus, um, the glycoprotein. And so that also is obviously made when the virus is replicating in cells. So using this microscopy-based assay, we then had to validate that we could, that we could in fact, um, observe an antiviral and quantify uh, the antiviral activity. And so we began using uh, two different uh, drugs. One uh, is an entry inhibitor, and it's hydroxychloroquine. So this was in early days when uh, hydroxychloroquine was really being touted as a, a potent antiviral. And so we also found in these Vero cells that we could inhibit infection with hydroxychloroquine um, in, in concentrations that were not toxic. So in all of my slides, the green lines will be toxicity and the blue lines will be um, the, the percentage of infection. So as the percentage of infection goes down, that, that shows um, antiviral activity. So we, in addition to hydroxychloroquine, we also tested um, remdesivir, which is what I, what I earlier discussed, which is uh, an inhibitor of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from the virus. And so that uh, blocks RNA replication. So hydroxychloroquine blocks entry by um, deacidifying endosomes. So the entry pathway, at least in some contexts, is dependent on an acid pH compartment. So hydroxychloroquine um, dissolves that pH gradient, and so the virus uh, can't be in this uh, low pH compartment and so can't trigger. And the second remdesivir actually targets a viral protein. So that's a host um, targeting uh, molecule and a, and a viral targeting molecule. But given that we were able to quantitatively measure both toxicity and infection, we then went on to screen uh, some of our drug libraries. So here I'm, I'm showing you uh, the screen at one micromolar on Vero cells of about 3,000 drugs, where um, the ones on the left that go down are the drugs that block infection and the ones that go up um, I guess somewhat increased infection, but we're looking for the antivirals here. And so there were six drugs that made our cutoffs for an antiviral. And so um, we took those six drugs and tested them in dose response, and four of them had submicromolar um, antiviral activity and low toxicity. So they're shown here where, again, you can see the blue lines show quite potent activity and the green lines um, are uh, distinct from the blue line. So that is, at the active concentrations, the drugs are not toxic. But um, it was a little bit surprising to us that only, let's say, four drugs out of the 3,000 were active. Because um, within that library of 3,000 were many, many drugs that had been re reported by uh, many other investigators as being active. So this made us think a little bit harder about the differences between our assay and many other people's assays. And so one might have been the cutoffs. So we, we drew our cutoff at 60% inhibition. So that's only actually a little bit more than twofold, which we felt was um, generous. And then the other thing that we um, incorporated into our uh, cutoffs was um, cell death because we had a readout for cell death within every well. And so we also removed any um, compounds that were toxic, that had more than 20% death um, at, the, at the concentration uh, reported. But again, we were a little bit surprised at how few drugs were antiviral. We'll talk a little bit about, about some of these in a minute um, uh, as we discuss some of the other screens that we've done. Okay. So then we decided, well, you know, the Vero cells are an African green monkey cell. They've been in culture for decades. Um, they're really permissive to many, many viruses, so they're defective for many pathways that 
are presumably important in normal cells. So we decided that what we really were interested in is screening in human cells, right? So um, the first human cell that we found that was permissive to infection was a human hepatocyte cell line called HUH 7.5. And the reason we tested these early on, and, and one of the reasons um, maybe they're so permissive is that they're actually uh, a cell line that's routinely used for many other viruses, including uh, hepatitis C virus, which um, can't replicate in most cell lines. And so it's thought that the reason that it's most permissive is because it's defective for innate immune signaling. And so we reason that maybe these would be more permissive to SARS-CoV-2 as well, as they're more permissive to many other uh, viruses. And so indeed, we were able to show uh, early on that SARS-CoV-2 could infect uh, these human hepatocyte cells. And so again, you're, I'm showing you here the micrograph of uh, plus and minus uh, infection uh, using the double-stranded RNA um, uh, antibody. And again, we looked at the two um, known inhibitors, the entry inhibitor, hydroxychloroquine, and the RNA replication inhibitor, remdesivir. And again, we could show very potent activities for these uh, inhibitors in these cells. Okay. So then again, we screened the library, um, and we identified um, 33 drugs that were active. So this was way more than in Vero cells. And in dose responses, looking um, at activity versus toxicity, uh, 23 of them validated. So, um, and three of the 23 of the, uh, of the validated hits were um, the, within the Vero hits. So three of the four Vero hits were also active in these human hepatocytes, okay? And so this is a, now a pie chart of the 23 drugs that we validated in dose response. And they fall into a number of different categories. And again, we'll talk more about them in detail in a minute. But some of these categories were what were what actually we expected um, to come out as antiviral. So I'm showing you some examples of these different categories here. So for example, it's known that, that there are proteases that are required for um, infection, and that's actually why hydroxychloroquine can block infection, because um, the acid pH uh, is required to activate cathepsins, which are proteases that are acid dependent. And so indeed, we found that the cathepsin inhibitors uh, were antiviral in these cells, so that's here. Uh, for there's another example of kinase inhibitors. So it's known that many viruses are dependent on kinase signaling pathways for uh, their activity. And we identified a number of kinase inhibitors, one of which here is shown as an mTOR inhibitor. And we identified drugs in a number of other categories, including um, an epigenetic drug, um, drugs against epigenetic factors and other um, GPCRs, for example. So that was really exciting to us that we were ident able to identify additional targets that seem to be potently antiviral in, in these human cells. But then this leads to the question of, well, if there's such big differences between the hepatocytes and the Vero cells, what about lung epithelial cells? Because actually the major target in humans are in fact the lung epithelium and the nasal epithelium. So the question is, can we model these, these respiratory epithelial cells and, and how many of these drugs are active in that context? And so the cell line that we um, began to use is a cell line called CALU3, which is being widely used in the, in the, um, in the field uh, because these cells are very permissive to SARS-CoV-2. And so again, we began by looking at whether or not the known antivirals were active in these uh, CALU3 cells. And so I'm just showing you again, um, the picture of that uh, entry pathway um, to, to remind you that um, there are a number of different drugs again that have been shown to be active, including remdesivir. So right, so that's the RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor. And, in, and indeed the direct acting antiviral is antiviral in the Vero cells the hepatocytes, and the lung epithelial cells. But when we started looking at the entry inhibitors, we were quite surprised. So um, this is in the Vero cells where, again, we, I'm re-showing you the hydroxychloroquine, and I'm also showing you a cathepsin inhibitor. And you can see that both of these drugs have activity in Vero cells. But another, another drug, um, uh, Camistat, 
which blocks TEMPRIS-2, has no activity in these cells. And that's actually um, been shown that these cells don't express TEMPRIS-2. So if you go back to the um, picture on the left, what has been shown is that the virus binds the receptor ACE2 and then can be um, activated for fusion by this uh, serine protease uh, TEMPRIS-2. And so in cells that don't express TEMPRIS-2, like the Vero cells, it seems that the virus goes through this um, uh, endocytosis pathway to a low pH compartment that then allows cathepsins to cleave uh, the spike and, and trigger fusion. And again, this is again what was in the literature at the time. So again, we looked in the hepatocytes and we saw something very similar, right? That the acidification blocker and the cathepsin inhibitors could block infection. But again, the TEMPRIS-2 inhibitor camistat had no effect in these cells. In contrast, when we looked in these CalU3 cells, this is where we were quite surprised. In fact, hydroxychloroquine and the cathepsin inhibitor had absolutely no activity in these cells, while camistat, the uh, TEMPRIS-2 inhibitor, was potently antiviral. So these data suggest that maybe the, the virus is going through com two completely different pathways depending on the cell type. But because there is so much literature about, the, about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, we looked at a larger panel of these acidification blockers just to be certain that there was not something unique about hydroxychloroquine in these cells. And so we got a panel of um, chloroquine derivatives working with medicine from malaria venture, and we tested them. And so this is the data in the hepatocytes, the Vero cells, and the CalU3 cells. And I hope you can appreciate that, in the, that if you look at the IC50s in the hepatocytes, these are basically very, very potent antivirals. But if you look at the IC50s in CalU3 cells, they basically have no activity at all. So that really shows that it's not something specific to hydroxychloroquine, but there's something uniquely different about the entry pathways that are used in different cell types. So it seems that in cells that don't express TEMPRIS-2, the virus is exclusively dependent upon um, uh, the endosomal entry pathway and, and the activity of cathepsins. While in cells that express TEMPRIS-2, the virus is exclusively dependent on TEMPRIS-2, so that these pathways are actually not redundant in cells, but actually the virus moves through completely different pathways in different cell types. And so this has really important implications for treating humans because as we all know, the hydroxychloroquine trials were, um, did not show efficacy in humans. And I would uh, hypothesize that this may be because in the, in the respiratory epithelium where the virus is replicating to high levels, um, the virus is not dependent on acidification for entry, whereas it's actually very dependent on the TEMPRIS-2 um, and sensitive to chemistat. So now that we have this CalU3 model where we can look to and determine whether or not um, antivirals or potential antivirals are active in the respiratory epithelium, uh, we took the 23 antivirals that we found were active against um, the SARS coronavirus 2 in the hepatocytes and asked whether or not they were active in the lung epithelial cells. And actually consistent with what I just told you about how some of the pathways are completely different in different cell types, only nine of the 23 antivirals were active in CalU3s. So these are the IC50 curves for the nine antivirals that showed some activity in the CalU3 cells. And you can see by looking at just the shapes of these curves that some of them are more active than others. Some of them show some toxicity, but there are a handful of them that seem to be very active in these CalU3 cells, suggesting that we should think harder about what their mechanisms of action might be and whether or not they're um, active in, in, in uh, primary models. So one, one thing that we um, feel is really important is, is to perform a different kind of assay. So what I've been showing you throughout is this microscopy-based assay where we're quantifying you know, per cell using a microscope whether or not a cell is infected or uninfected. But another um, straightforward assay to look at the level of viral replication is to do RTQPCR for viral RNA to ask how much is the viral RNA affected by these antivirals.
And so we developed a sensitive RT-qPCR assay to look at whether or not antivirals were active. So this is a graph of the change in um, viral RNA when we treat it treat with these um, nine drugs as well as remdesivir. So if you look at the first bar, we've set the untreated infected um, well or cells to one, and that when we were treat the cells with remdesivir, we have more than a three log reduction in viral RNA. So consistent with the curves I'm showing you, remdesivir is very active in blocking viral rep replication in cell culture. And so then you can see the, the, um, the remaining drugs that we identified uh, that validated in, in the IC50 curves that, that all of them had a reduction of at least one log and some of them had a multi-log reduction in viral RNA, suggesting that they can, might be very potent antivirals. So just to remind you of the pie chart that I showed you of these different classes of antivirals, and again, only nine of them were active, some of the classes um, didn't show up at all in the lung epithelial cells. So one group is the protease inhibitors, that there, there, a number of them were active in the hepatocytes, and none of them were active in the uh, Cal U3 cells, suggesting that these proteases might all be targeting directly or indirectly some aspect of this endosomal entry pathway. We were also um, disappointed, to be honest, that the, the two epigenetic inhibitors that we had identified and validated in the hepatocytes also didn't uh, validate in the uh, lung epithelial cells. And also a number of kinase inhibitors um, did, not, did not validate. So there were just sort of a number of, of, of drugs, some were expected, some unanticipated that, that did not uh, show activity in the lung epithelial model. Um, but we did, like I said, validate uh, nine drugs. So I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, these nine antivirals. So four of them are approved drugs, and those are cyclosporin, selenomycin, H an H1 antihistamine, and an EGF receptor inhibitor. So these uh, all showed efficacy in, um, in the CALU model, as well as in hepatocytes, because that's where we identified them. Uh, and uh, I think it's quite interesting that we identified this H1 antihistamine, Abastine, as uh, antiviral, because this is uh, approved all over Asia, and, and there are clinical trials um, happening right now. So we're really um, hoping to see some activity with these um, and with this class of antivirals. Uh, we also identified two uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like I said, an EGFR inhibitor, which is actually an approved drug, uh, as well as an inhibitor against a, um, a gene called Axel. So EGFR is a classic growth factor receptor and actually has been shown to promote entry for many viruses, and we're currently determining whether or not it's um, promoting entry of this virus. And Axel is a well-known attachment factor. So many, many viruses uh, bind to Axel in order to um, increase their ability to be um, internalized into uh, cells. And actually there's a fast track trial um, in, in Britain uh, testing bemcentinib in, uh, in clinical trials in humans. So again, we're really um, interested in seeing how those uh, trials play out, given that these two drugs seem to be quite potent um, in blocking viral infection in these um, respiratory epithelial cells. So um, one question is, um, is if, if these uh, genes are important, is their downstream signaling important for viral infection? And in fact, um, we have identified two different mTOR inhibitors, which is a kinase that's known to be downstream of receptor tyrosine kinases. And we um, identified these two different uh, mTOR inhibitors. And interestingly, both of these drugs um, target both mTOR1 and mTOR2. And that seems to be important for their activity because in the library, we had a, a large number of what are called rapalogs or rapamycin derivatives which um, don't target uh, both mTOR1 and mTOR2. So it suggests that uh, targeting both of those kinases is what's required. And again, we're testing if that activity is downstream of these receptor tyrosine kinases. Okay.
So then we identified uh, a few other um, uh, drugs. So one thing we identified is, um, sorry, our iron chelator, uh, which um, seems to be antiviral. And because of the some of the pathology in humans could be related to increased iron in patients, and the fact that iron chelators can be um, impact endothelial inflammation. There's actually a clinical trial underway with related iron chelators. So again, it will be interesting to, to see how these uh, play out. And then we identified um, two drugs with unknown targets, selenomycin um, and Y320. Selenomycin is actually an approved drug that's being used in cancer. And we've actually identified a number of analogs of selenomycin that are um, antiviral. So we're really interested in trying to uncover uh, what the target might be of selenomycin that's causing it to be so potently antiviral. So um, that's this group. So the, uh, the last um, drug that I, from this um, screen that I really want to talk about is our identification of cyclosporin. So um, Cyclosporin is a, an approved immunosuppressant, um, and it's, it works through the inhibition of the interaction between cyclophilin and calcineurin. And so blocking calcineurin blocks immune activation. And so that's, how, that's why it's used as an immunosuppressant. But actually, cyclophilin and calcineurin activity have shown to, be, um, to impact many different viral infections, and in fact, um, including many of the uh, related coronaviruses to SARS-CoV-2. And so we're interested in understanding how, um, how cyclosporin was antiviral and whether or not that might be a clinically tractable uh, approach. So like I said, cyclosporin blocks the, uh, the activity of uh, calcineurin by impacting the interaction between cyclophilin and calcineurin. So it actually blocks both of these um, proteins activity so we were under, wanted to discover if the activity was through calcineurin or through inhibition of cyclophilin. And so we treated cells with FK506, which just blocks calcineurin and not cyclophilin, and that did not show activity. And we also tested an NFAT inhibitor. So NFAT is one of the major targets downstream of calcineurin. And so we uh, used an inhibitor against NFAT to ask if that was antiviral, and it was not. So together, these data suggested that cyclophilin was what was, was uh, important for viral infection, and that if we could just target cyclophilin, that that might uh, control infection. And so we uh, tested a drug called NIM811, which is in fact a cyclosporin analog that targets cyclophilin but not calcineurin, and we found that that was active. So again, altogether, this data suggests that the inhibition of cyclophilin is what's antiviral, and that the inhibition of calcineurin uh, is not important for the antiviral activity of cyclosporin. So again, we, we wanted to verify these results using uh, an independent assay, and we did uh, the qPCR assay in both the HOH7 cells, the, the hepatocytes, and the respiratory cells. And we could see that in both cases, both cyclosporin and this NIM811 could block infection suggesting that they were uh, bona fide antivirals. And interestingly, we don't see any of these activities in these Vero cells, again, suggesting that there are fundamental differences between Vero cells and uh, not Vero cells. Okay, so there's actually um, a drug called Alisporavir, which is an oral drug that was uh, used in clinical trials for its activity against hepatitis C virus. And so it was really, um, and it, it was used in this clinical trial where they did a randomized trial combining alisporavir with um, the standard of care in, in hepatitis C virus, peg interferon and ribavirin. And, um, and it didn't show any benefit over the, the current therapy. But it also suggests that alisporavir may be um, an orally available antiviral that might be able to be used against SARS-CoV-2. So we tested alisporavir in CalU3 cells and were, was able to show that alisporavir had in fact activity against SARS-CoV-2 in the CalU3 cells. So that became somewhat exciting to us. We also just, um, because of the difficulties in working with SARS-CoV-2 
wanted to, to think about whether or not um, this allosporavir might be active against other coronaviruses. So this is a, a diagram of different coronaviruses and in the red boxes are the ones that um, are pathogenic to humans and have caused um, outbreaks in the last decade or so. And so other of these are actually, actually um, viruses that infect us all the time and cause sort of a common cold. Uh, and one of these viruses that, uh, these common circulating viruses that we obtained is a virus called OC43. And so we wanted to see if uh, these um, analogs were antiviral against OC43. And indeed, um, OC43 infects these HUH7.5 cells. And in our preliminary data, we've been able to show that both NIM811 and Alisporavir can block um, OC43 replication, again, suggesting not only that Alisporavir might be um, a good candidate, but that it may be a really antiviral against uh, coronaviruses in general, which would be um, really useful uh, in the future in case of any um, new, new outbreaks in, in, of other coronaviruses in, in, in coming years. So then the question, of course, is whether or not it's antiviral in primary cells. So, you know, we're getting, you know, more and more relevant by moving from viros to human cells to these uh, respiratory cells, but these are also not primary cells. And so we've um, begun to, to test some of our candidates in primary cell models. So um, one model that we have are these are primary human bronchial epithelial cells and we've been able to show by our RTQ-PCR assay that both cyclosporin and allosporavir show uh, activity against the virus. In addition, we have human IPS cell-derived type 2 alveolar epithelial cells. And again, we were able to show that both cyclosporin and allosporavir have activity against the virus, suggesting again that we may be able to um, repurpose allosporavir for use uh, in this, uh, against this virus. So future studies are aimed at trying to validate the results in animal models to really determine how active it may be and how much disease it might be able to ameliorate. But I think you can take away from, from uh, this, this talk that we really think that we have to look directly in respiratory cells if we're really gonna find antivirals that are active. So using the assay that we developed in CalU3 cells, we've screened um, our library, uh, our repurposing library and identified 88 candidates that were antiviral in these cells, uh, 16 of which are FDA approved drugs. So I just wanna give you a flavor of what we identified. So we found a different additional nucleosides that are antiviral. So some are shown here where we found that, um, for example, mercaptopurine and other um, nucleosides that are used in cancer therapies are active against um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we also identified additional Tempris-2 inhibitors. So in addition to Camistat, we found uh, an, uh, another um, uh, Tempris-2 inhibitor, Nefamistat, is highly active against um, the virus in these cells. We identified additional signaling inhibitors, so kinase inhibitors that were antiviral. And so uh, I just want to point out, so I had already told you that in the hepatocyte screen, we identified EGFR uh, inhibitors. But actually, in this screen, we also identified, in addition to EGFR and TOR inhibitors, we also identified uh, MAP kinase inhibitors. So the two main pathways downstream of EGFR seem to be really important for promoting uh, viral infection. And we're again trying to characterize the mechanisms by which this works. So uh, hopefully I've, I've convinced you that there's a number of important lessons that we've learned and really we're moving uh, these studies in, in, in new directions. So one thing is that I think there are major differences in cell types. So they're just how the virus moves through different cells is really um, an important facet. And so you have to use relevant study cells to discover antivirals that are active. Um, so Vero cells may be good to find direct acting antivirals, but not necessarily for host directed antivirals. And this is also captured in RNA-seq data where we took either CalU3s or uh, these hepatocytes and infected them with the virus and looked at what genes 
are induced upon infection. And you can see there's very little overlap and even in the responses of these cells to infection. So again, we really need to remember that the virus is infecting normally very specialized cells. I do think the entry pathways are good targets, but we need to model this correctly. We can't just assume everything uh, will be the same in different cell types. I personally think cyclophilin is a clinically actionable target, and we're trying to get this into preclinical models to determine, in fact, how well um, these cyclophilin inhibitors work in vivo. We've identified additional targets, some of which I've mentioned, and we're continuing to validate all of the candidates that um, we think are uh, potentially uh, useful in primary these primary cell models uh, and additional models that we're um, working on these days. Um, as I said, we're screening additional libraries in CalU3 cells, and we're actually have screened these libraries against um, the common cold virus, OC43, to try to understand the similarities and differences between host factor dependencies in the, of these different viruses. And then the last point I want to make is we're currently doing um, synergy studies to try to identify combinations of drugs that are most potent. So, you know, for HIV and hepatitis C virus, we treat people with cocktails of, of antivirals in order to block infection. And that may be what we need to do here with SARS-CoV-2. And so we're trying to take our, our best candidates and look uh, in two by two dose responses to ask if there's any interactions or, or any increase in potency if we combine them. So for example, here you can see uh, the percent inhibition of infection if we either dose in remdesivir or canistat. And then we can take this data and ask if the, if the expected values are different uh, than just um, you know, independent uh, antiviral activity. And so we use a model called uh, BLISS to, to, to quantify that. And what we found, for example, with this combination is that there's no uh, interaction between remdesivir and the entry inhibitor camistat. And so we're doing large scale combinations now to see if we can identify combinations that are an additive or synergistic in order to really come up with the best strategy um, moving forward. So with that, I'd just like to thank the members of my lab uh, and the members of the High Throughput Screening Corps, in particular David Schultz, as well as all of our collaborators who have contributed to various aspects of this, um, as well as our external collaborations that have provided um, either funding or drugs or suggestions on how to move forward with some of these uh, candidates. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Sherry, for your informative presentation. Uh, we will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the, click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. And let's get started. Our first question is going to be, are in vitro enhancing, are in vitro enhancing antibodies disqualified for COVID treatment? Um, well, we're not really working on uh, therapeutic antibodies, but um, I, I, don't, I haven't seen much data on, on uh, antibodies that enhance infection. So this virus infection is quite different than um, some of the others that uh, where antibodies can enhance um, infectivity. This has not really been shown, to my knowledge, in SARS-CoV-2 infection. And how long after infection can antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 still be detected in someone's blood? Well, I mean, the the outbreak only started a few months ago, and so uh, obviously still we can detect antibodies in most people who have been infected. I think that to answer that question, we have to wait a lot longer after infection to see whether or not they decline differently than uh, other kinds of viral infections. But it's a really important question, uh, which has really big impacts on the vaccine uh, strategies that are being used. So the assumption is that, that antibodies, either from infection or that are elicited to a vaccine, would last a, a, a reasonable amount of time um, to protect from reinfection. And do the antibody levels correlate with the disease severity and long-term immunity? So of the studies that I know about, um, the actually uh, patients that are hospitalized have some of the highest 
antibody levels. So um, there's some question about whether or not the flavor of the antibodies are different, but the absolute amount of antibodies um, are quite high in hospitalized patients, suggesting that there's not a direct correlation between these um, values. Looks like we have one more question. Um, as you're speaking through all the antivirals that are being tested, which look, the, which look the most promising, and how many clinical trials does it take to safely say, quote unquote, it works? Um, yeah, so I think that a handful of the antivirals that we've identified um, are tractable with the time frame consistent with this outbreak. So in order to move something into the clinic soon, it will have already had to have gone through phase one or phase two trials. So that means taking only drugs that are already approved for something else and repurposing them. So we've only identified a handful of those. And of those, we're trying to get uh, preclinical testing and rodent models in order to show efficacy against SARS-CoV-2 in an animal. And only those that, would go, that um, showed efficacy would potentially move forward. In terms of saying it works, that's a more complicated question, but you would need you need randomized clinical trials that have defined endpoints. And if we if you had um, you know strong signal in a randomized clinical trial with defined endpoints, then you would at least have some signal. But saying something works is is complicated, right? Because unless it's a a home run. It, it's going to take. It takes a lot of, of uh, testing in various humans. So remdesivir is a good example of that. That it certainly shows activity, but it's it's not black and white. That was the last of our questions, Dr. Cherry. Do you have any final comments for the audience? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think that it's really important for us to to push forward both vaccines and therapeutics, um, both for this outbreak and future outbreaks. And I'm really hopeful that uh, between all the different approaches being taken that we'll um, find something active um, and be able to impact the outbreak sometime soon. Well, thank you again, Dr. Cherry, for your time today and your important research. We really appreciate you. Um, before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand for six months to March of 2021. Labroots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.